welcome to the first uh, encounter that we are going to be playing using the five parsecs rules. I am tentatively entitling this counter to hell with Caesar. And that's H-A-I-L. <laughs> and as I told you guys in the uh, pre-video, Jake Mandrake and his crew have landed on the planet Cirrus. And their goal is to eliminate the leader of a feral band named Caesar. You can see in the background there, that is Jake and his team disembarking from the Bethesda. This is the planet Kiris, which is basically a jungle planet with a largely human population. But as late... A band of hybrid ferals have been terrorizing the planet and the local government has contracted a job for Jake Mandrake and his crew to eliminate their leader, whose name is Caesar. And that is him right there at the head of his pack. As you can see, he is a mutant, I mean a bounty tracker in the game. Uh, so he's a pretty, pretty, pretty tough guy to deal with. Pharaoh in general, I think, are, are going to be tough. I've never played it, but we will see how they play. Uh, I have already rolled for my reactions down there. I got two uh, results that I could use. So one I gave to Rombot. The other one I have not quite assigned yet. Because what I have come to do is the first thing we do... Uh, when we start playing, or when you start your first battle in uh, five parsecs from home is, we will see if we can seize the initiative. Because if we can seize the initiative the way I read the rules, we will be allowed to get some pre-set up positions, which would basically uh, represent Jake and his crew getting into some good firing positions. And that would be very important. Now, we are going to suffer a minus one on this row. We're going to row 2d6. We're going to suffer a minus one on this row because we are going against uh, professional hired muscle. So it is not easy to get the initiative on them. But we can add the savvy of one of our members. And I think our robot, uh, I think our robot Rombot has a savvy of... Is it one or two? A savvy of two, actually. So that's actually pretty high in this game. We get one if we are outnumbered, which we are. There is about seven of them to our four. So that would add three. When hiring opponents from the hired muscle, minus one. So I already mentioned that. Difficulty mode, no. Campaign difficulty mode, no. So we're not doing any of that or insanity mode. So uh, the next thing we do on a total of ten plus... Any character in your crew may either take a normal move or may fire before the battle begins. Any shots taken only hit on a natural six. Let's see if we get a 10 plus. That's not easy. So we have eight. Let me see. Did you guys see that? I rolled an eight. We get three, which would be eight, nine, 10, 11. Minus one, we still have a 10. So I will be able to get a free move or a free shot. Okay, so having earned that free shot, and that has nothing to do with our initiative dice, which we're going to move over here, because that will be at the start of turn one. This is not turn one. Now, I will tell you guys this, in case you're going to try to follow this in your own games. I am going to be reducing the ranges of all the weapons in my game by half until further notice. And the reason I say that is some of the weapons in here have 24-inch range, which if you're pay playing on a 2x2 two two table, that's the entire length of the table. Other weapons have 30-inch range, which is almost the entire length of the table. And I think that would make some very, very quick games. Uh, you know, obviously you would, you know, you can try to block or hide, but once somebody gets a good shot on you, you're kind of done. At that kind of range. And for at least for my game effects. Until I see. You know how things are going. I'm going to just cut all the ranges in half. That's fair. I don't think it affects any other weapon. Because relative to other weapons. They will all still have their same range. So basically. A weapon that has 30 inches. 
versus a weapon that has 15 is going to be the same when the weapon that has 30 goes down to 15 and the weapon at 15 goes down to 7 or 7.5. So I, I don't really think it's going to affect nothing other than I think it will allow me to maybe have a little more, make my games a little more interesting. Now, having said that, I get one figure I can move because we were able to seize the initiative. And obviously, my first thing is the Rombot. Now, I can move the Rombot, but uh, I also am wondering if I am in line to take a shot. Now, I have not set these up like they should be set up, I guess, yet. So I am going to do that. And decide. I think Jake and them, uh, you know, they're pretty much, I think they're going to be pretty much where I want them at. But I do want to reset up the, uh, I want to reset up the uh, Pharaoh. Because right now they're kind of in the open. Which I don't think they would come out, even though they're aggressive. I think they would, and so they're going to set up in this group within one inch of each other. The first thing I'm going to do is put the leader back here because they know he's their leader. They know they've probably had other bounty hunters come. The the uh, the Jaguar figures or Panther figures, these are actually my lieutenant and my specialist. So this is the specialist, and this one is the lieutenant. So that's how I can tell how they are being feral. Uh, all of the tiger stripe ones are your regular troops. So this is going to be their initial setup. They kind of have their leader protected back there. Uh, because I don't, I don't want to play some hack where you just get a lucky shot and, and the game is over. Now, having done that, I have to decide who is going to take this free move with the initiative and what they're going to do with it. All right, so this is an example of what I was talking about. Normally from here, my Rombot would have a shot with his, uh, I think it is an infantry rifle that has a range of 30 inches. It is a heavy weapon. But now that I've cut the range in half, he only has 15 inches. And going by 15 inches from the hex he's in, He's just short of targeting that lead uh, Pharaoh. So having said that, the next question is, am I going to move him or do I leave him here? One of the things I'm thinking is moving the Rombot to a position opposite the rest of the team uh, so that he can maybe draw fire or draw attention away from them or keeping them all together. So I haven't decided but take because we have seized the initiative, I'm going to move him. And obviously, my first thing is going to be to get him in cover. And so we are going to put him right here where he will get the cover of this piece of terrain. I wasn't able to quite move him uh, out of their line of fire, but that does give him cover. He has a speed of four. I can add two if he's not shooting. So he's at one, two, three, four, five, six. So that's exactly where he can go. Although he's probably going to be in their range now. But if they get within five inches of him, he causes them to suffer a minus one. So I got to be careful because I don't want to have him get killed with a lucky shot or even a barrage of shots. And I can't afford to put most of my team right up there with him uh, in this phase. So let me see how far they are. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So they would basically need a weapon with a range of 18 to take a shot at him. And from what I can see... The Pharaoh, their best weapon has a range of, and I'm just saying now, uh, they can move and shoot. Their best weapon has a range of 24, so that would be cut to 12. So, yeah, they can hit him with most of what they got from there. So, let me pull him back. Let me think about this a little bit more from our setup. Because uh, they're all exiting this uh, craft. So, 
I think what I'm going to do is move him this way. So he goes one, two, three, four, five, six. He can go there, and that should block their line of sight to him, but it also blocks his line of sight to them uh, by this tree, this crop, because I'm going to consider anything that crosses that base is blocked. So they would literally have to move out here somewhere to take a shot on him, and he's covering that area now. So I'm going to do that. Hope that's not a bad move. Now, I did roll for my reactions. So one of them can act in the early phase. Whoever has a reaction of one. The two is actually for goes to my Rombot again. And you know what? I just thought of something. If he can act in the early phase, then I'm going to do this like I had planned. He is going to go here. Okay. So that is six. Let's see, let's see, let's see. He's going to go one, two, three, four, five, six. Or one, two, three, four, five, six. So I will put him here. Right, because I forgot the first turn is separate. So I'm going to give him that die in the early phase, and he should be able to pick off to pick off that lead feral which I think is going to be the only one that could take an early shot at him uh, without him without uh, having to move. So I, I'm happy with that. I have a one, which I could give to Jake or Trish or Mace. Let me see what they're wielding. So Jake has a, he has a hand cannon that has eight inches, which I'm cutting to four, which is a pistol. And he has a rifle that has 24 inches and two shots. So I definitely want to give it to Jake. Now, in this game, you can move and then shoot, but in that order. You can't shoot, then move, or whatever. You can move and then shoot. So, assuming the Rombot takes out this lead Pharaoh up here, I need Jake to be able to get a decent shot off. And he can only move four if he wants to shoot. If he doesn't want to shoot, he can dash and he can move two more, which I'm going to have him do. So he's going to go one, two, three, four, five, six. So, yeah, he should be blocked by this and by this. He wasn't able to get all the way there. Or maybe I should just run him into these woods. Let me see. One, two, three, four, five, six. So I'm going to count him there as into the woods. I don't really think it changes much because they're still, this is still blocking. They're going to have to come out from there, but he does not get a shot. I'm going to assume he's taking some cover in those rocks, if you can see that. And that is going to be the end of uh, Jake's turn for his crew. So they're set up, but there was no firing done. Okay, so I'm going to resolve the Rombot shot, and I'm trying to determine if this character has any cover, but I can draw an unobstructed line. It doesn't even cut through this base, so I'm going to say he has no cover. Now, the Rombot did move, and his hunting rifle is considered heavy, so he will suffer a minus one, but since the character is in the open... Uh, and within range. I don't think he's within six. We need a five plus. That means we would need a six. So this is not going to be an easy shot. Uh, if he was within six, that would go down to a three. But so we need a six. Let's see if we can find the die. That might be a little more lucky. And so that was a two. He only rolled a two, which is a miss. So that is not going to do anything. But that was my Rombot shot. Now, Jake acted, but he has no shot because he has no line of sight to anybody. Which means now we will go to the enemy phase and they will act in the order of the closest one to 
uh, to a target. And so if you're using the AI, these guys would be considered aggressive. And what the rules say, uh, if you are dealing with aggressive figures is, let me see where I put that. Basically, it says they're going to try to move into contact, but uh, other than that, they will shoot, obviously. So it says aggressive enemies with opponents in sight will advance at least half a move towards them, attempting to remain in cover if possible. Enemies that are unable to see, blah, blah, blah. Heavy weapon figures will not move if they have a line of sight. So all of these, these regular Pharaoh are armed with, uh, I think they're armed with military rifles, which was actually a pretty good weapon. Yeah, they're armed with military rifles. They have 24 inch, so that is within range, but it is not, they're not within six. So they said they would do a half move. Now, normally they could do a dash, but if you do a dash, you can't shoot. So this guy is going to try to stay in cover and go one, two, three, which is a half move of six. Doesn't really have much cover he can stay into, but he's kind of hugging that obstruction there. He will now be able to fire his, uh, his military rifle. Let's see if he got within six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Just missed it. So he will also need a six, I believe. Because I think, let me see if there's any deduction for moving. Okay, so it doesn't look like you suffer any modifier for moving unless you have a heavy weapon. One thing I did forget to do with the Rombot shot was add his combat skill. So I did check. He rolled a two. So even with this combat skill, which I think is only uh, one, that wouldn't have been a hit. Uh, these guys, the Pharaoh, he's also now needing, I think he needs a five. Uh, because his weapon is not considered a heavy weapon. So his combat skill for the Pharaoh, their combat skill, do they have? It's just zero. And he rolled a six. Even though it went off the table, he rolled a six. So that would be a hit with his rifle, which is not a good way to start the game off. It has zero to damage, no other specialties. Uh, the Rombot's toughness is four. So I think he will need a four or higher to hit. One D6 plus the damage rating what did he roll? He rolled a three, which is good because that is not enough. That is not enough to damage him. Uh, you have to equal or exceed the toughness rate. Now, for one of my crew, that would have been enough. But the Rombot will take a... He will take a stun. Although, I guess Rombots can be stunned. And move back one inch. So we are going to move him back one inch, which actually may help him because now some of the other pharaohs that act will not be able to target him as easily. Okay, so the pharaoh have taken their moves. I'm going to be doing some shooting, uh, but before I did that, I wanted to show you where things have changed. Now, I think normally you're supposed to do their move and shot one at a time. But I kind of moved everybody, and then I'm going to work out those who have shots. I mean, I'm playing solo, so I don't think it makes a difference. These guys did a dash. Their speed is five. A dash, you get two, as long as you don't go into combat. And they get plus one, so they were able to move eight inches. And they are trying to get around the rombot here, maybe even engage it in a brawl. Over here... Caesar moved up, but he's basically trying to stay in cover because he doesn't want to come this way and perhaps let Jake get a shot on him. Uh, so he's coming here. His lieutenants, however, have begun to move through this terrain. They paid the price to get up here, and they've kind of moved across there uh, with their remaining movement. I think they have some shots if they are in range. And that is what we're going to see because potentially he has a shot and these two do. 
Although this one shot might be a little blocked or obscured. But let's check on his shot. So he would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 inches away. With an infantry rifle, I think it is 12 inches. So he would have a shot. Uh, because, because it is more than six inches, uh, the Rombot, I'm not going to give him cover anymore because he kind of got knocked out that cover when he got stunned. You know, he got knocked out of the cover, but, uh, the target is within range, which would be a five plus is what he would need to hit. He has a zero combat skill. Oh my goodness, these guys are rolling sixes like crazy. Okay, so we're going to do the wound again. And uh, let's just roll it. He rolled a three. So once again, he misses. But that will put another stun on the Rombot. And it will also move it back another inch. So... We're going to move him back here this time. He's picked up two stuns. That's why you, you don't want to fire them all at the same time, right? Because every time they get hit, they're going to go back an inch. So that may mean somebody else's shot is now out of range, which is what we're going to have to check for the lieutenant. The lieutenant is... Uh, and right now, I'm kind of playing this by ear. I will double check to make sure I'm doing everything right uh, in between rounds. But the lieutenant's, uh, what weapon is he using? He's also got a military rifle with 24 inches. So that would give him a 12 inch range. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So he would still, he would still be able to hit in range. I don't know if I'm going to get about any cover, though, because I don't really think, I don't think it crosses through anything, although he is shooting out of that terrain, but it's kind of elevated. But he would also need a five. Is that a heavy weapon? Nope, just a regular military rifle, one shot, and he only rode a two, because I'm not giving him those brown dice anymore for a while. We're going to sit them down. Until I get to, I'm going to save them for my team. Of course, I bet then they'll start rolling low. But we will see. So, that is his shot. The, uh, the specialist has a shotgun, which only has a range of 12, which now would be 6. So, that would be out of his range. He would not have a shot at all. Uh... Although it normally gets two shots. You can see what I'm talking about in this game, though. If I had not cut the ranges, this guy's shot would have been hitting on like a three. Because it would have been, I think it would have been within, well, it still would have been a five because it would have been longer than six inches. But uh, these guys, all of these shots would be hitting, you know, almost with no kind of type of modified fires for range or distance or anything even the shotgun, so at 12 inches. So I cut the shotgun down now to 6 inches, and it is now out of range. The only one else that uh, could have tried to shoot is Caesar, and he's got a powerful gun. He's got a shell gun, which a 30-inch range, which would mean he can go 15 inches with two shots. It is heavy, and it is area, uh, an area effect. So, man, he can tear some people up with that. Uh, but... He did not move into position to shoot because I did not want to leave him out front and have him get a lucky kill. I mean, get killed unluckily as he is the target of this operation. And so that is going to conclude their turn. Nobody got killed or taken out of action. So we will not have to do a morale check for any other teams to roll and see if any of them skedaddle. So we will be going into turn two. Okay, I forgot. We're not going into turn two. I have not done the actions for the slow actions yet. And that is for Mace and Trish. Now, I did not quite understand in the rules if when you assign the dice, if that is the order they have to act in. 
uh, because like I had a three and a five. I got that impression because in one of his examples, he said he was going to assign one to three and the other one to five. So I'm assuming that's the order they would have to act in uh, in the slow phase. I think he did say in the quick phase, you can make them act in any order you want if you're giving out the ones. So I don't know. I don't really know if it makes that much of a difference. I'm not going to play by that right now. I'm just going to move them in whatever order I want. But, uh, you know, I will kind of keep a note of that in the future. So, you know, if we're deciding who to give what die to. Now, obviously, Mace and Trish see what's taking place. And they can see that the Pharaoh are closing in on the Rombot. The Rombot already has two stuns on it. And, uh, you know, at this point, you know, the, uh, they're no closer to taking out Caesar because he is doing a good job of concealing himself. The question then becomes, though, is uh, what can they do to help out Ram the Rombot? Because right now the Rombot is taking them on all by himself. And, you know, they have got to find a way to take some pressure off him because he's only been lucky yet that he has not been damaged or taken out of the game. You know, and next turn I'm going to have to resolve those uh, those stuns. The problem is Trish has kind of a very useless scrap pistol and Mace has Mace has a decent weapon with his board and so let me see what he has. All right, so Mace has an infantry laser which normally has a range of 30. In this game he's going to have a range of 15. But he has a snapshot which if he is within 6 he gets a plus 1. His move is four. So the question is, can he use that move and still get a decent shot without exposing himself too much? And so I can either move him toward Jake, where they can kind of stay together and work together, or I can move him toward the Rombot. Now, Jake told his crew from the very beginning to focus on Caesar that Caesar and Caesar alone is their target and not to get distracted by what else is going on. So you also have to realize these are aggressive enemies, which mean they are going to come to us. Uh, and at this point, I think they both need to get into some kind of cover. So the first thing I'm going to do is I am actually going to move Trish. She is going to fall back here behind cover she only has a scrap pistol with a range of nine which would go down to five I guess I'll round it up uh, but you know she can she can be in covered I'm gonna give her hard cover right there so that will resolve her right there because like I said these guys are going to come to us and our job is to get a shot on Caesar now, we obviously may have to take out some of them, but at this point, it's more important that we get a shot on Caesar. With that being the case, if Mace does not try to shoot, he can actually probably catch up with uh, Jake. So he could go one, two, three, four, then he could dash one, two, which would not quite get him in the cover, though. And that's what I'm worried about. I think all of them need to get in cover. Uh, so here he could go one, two, three, four, and then one, two. So I'm going to do that. That will put him in some cover. It will also allow him to watch the Rombot's back and uh, get some shots at anybody that's coming through there the next turn. So they didn't really get to do that much. Like I said, Jake's already done his turn. Uh, the Rombot has done his. And now we're going to go into turn two. Okay, guys, so we are going to begin to turn two. I took some time to kind of refresh the ruse and uh, kind of double check what I'm doing. And so there's a couple of things I'm going to point out uh, because this is a learning game. And I want you guys to kind of be able to look at this as you're playing and uh, refer back to it. When you have a... Uh, 
action in the early phase, meaning the quick reaction phase, you can actually hold your turn and do what is called a snap fire and fire when your opponent moves. So basically, it's like a overwatch. Uh, I did not do that. I would have done that if I had known about it, but I didn't do that. But I do want to tell you that that is available to you. If you use that overwatch fire, you cannot move. So you, you better make sure you're where you want to be when the enemy comes at you. Uh, the other thing, though, is if you put a stun on a figure uh, with that snap fire, that figure cannot shoot in its uh, turn. So that could actually be very useful, especially if you have a character that has two or three shots. If he can use that overwatch like a covering fire, even if he doesn't kill them, if he stuns three figures, that's three figures that cannot return shots next turn. So that is going to be crucial, and it's something I may use this turn uh, if we get anybody that acts in the quick action phase. The other thing I noticed is if you accomplish your objective, depending on the, the uh, type of enemy you're fighting, whether they're aggressive, tactical, or whatever, you will roll to see if they keep fighting or if they just leave the field. You can always leave the field by just going off a table edge, and it doesn't have to be your own. So even if you have a character that's wounded and you want them to get out of here, they can get off a table edge. So you might want to keep that in mind if you've got somebody that's taken a lot of hits that looks like they're, they, they might get taken out next turn. You may want to start moving them to a table edge. Uh, the only exception is like if you're fighting in a building or a ship, you know, it has to be a reasonable exit, a real exit, so to speak. Uh, other than that, I think we are ready to uh, do our next rolls for our reactions. Uh, there was no morale checks because nobody was killed on the enemy side. Okay, so as we roll for our reaction, we're going to roll four dice. You really want ones or twos. That's going to be the best reactions for you. I got one one, so that was not good. Uh, I can give that. I think everybody has a reaction of one on my team, or is it just Jake? Jake has Jake has one. Re, he has a reflex or reaction. I don't know. He has one. Mason, Trish have one. So I could give that to any of them. If I had got it two, I could give it to the Rombot. Uh, now, if you take three stuns, you are basically out of action. So the Rombot is definitely in a position where he he may want to move. So I don't think I'm going to use him to sit there and do opportunity fire. But uh, I don't want him moving in the slow phase either. I don't think he's going to be able to stay there. So the Rombot is going to back up and do a move. Now, if you are stunned, you can either move or shoot. You can't do them both. So I'm going to give him this reaction. He's going to move back, and that will immediately take one stun off, and he can move. His movement is uh, his movement is speed. They call it speed. His speed is four, but he can get two. And I think he's going to fall back on Bethesda. He's taken a lot of fire, or at least try to fall back here. So he can go one. Where is he at? He can go one. Two, three, and then he can go four, five, six, and I don't want them being able to shoot at him this turn. Four, five, six, and so they cannot shoot across that, uh, across these this field. This this will block their sight completely. You know, unless they come around here somewhere. But that is the only person we have that was able to act in the quick reaction phase, which means kind of in a way, though, the pharaohs are going to have to come to us. So this should be quick. These pharaohs are going to do a dash because they cannot shoot at uh, Mace because they can't even see him because he's not on the edge. So they're going to go one, two, three, four. Then they can go two more plus one, four, five, six, seven. So he's going to try to get around there. He's going to go 
One, two, three, four, five, six. So he's going to try to close potentially for a brawl. But neither one of them can shoot because they did dashes. Uh, down here is pretty much going to be the same thing with these guys. So he's going to go one, two, three, four, five, six. He's going to hug that terrain. He's going to go one, two, three, four, five, six, and stay back there. The lieutenant, I don't know if I want to move the lieutenant and the uh, and the specialist, which are these two up here. Because they really don't have anybody in range or sight. But I think they would want to hang back there with Caesar and somewhat protect him. The question is, is Caesar going to move up? And, you know, to kind of explain what I'm trying to do with Caesar is... He's basically kind of sitting back there letting his men move up, waiting, you know, basically until he has somebody that he can come up and take the killing blow on. And so if I can get you a better look as we uh, focus our retico in there, you can see Caesar's sword sticking up over the vehicle, but clearly no, you can't get a line of sight on him. So Caesar is going to make them have to come to him or make them have to eliminate his men. And that is what's going to be facing Jake and them. But I think the rest of them are going to hang back and see what happens with their guys. Okay, and I did double check the rules. That was the other thing. In any phase uh, as the player, you can move your figures in whatever order you want. So it doesn't really matter about having to assign them the other dice. You can move them in whatever order you want in any phase. What we're looking at now is Mace. He can obviously see this guy approaching him. Now, he could actually move up to the edge of there and just take a shot, a straight-up shot with the guy. The problem is, I think if he gets that close, it will be considered a brawl. He has a... I think Mace has a, uh, a saber, which is melee, plus two brawl. It's elegant. Uh, it has plus one to damage. So you would think he would want to do that. The problem is next turn, you know, he may have, he may be, he'll be standing at the edge and he could take a lot of fire unless he's able to act in the early phase and move back into cover. And so that does worry me. He does have a, a flak vest on. Uh, I mean, it would make more sense to wait for this guy to come into the woods and in that way, his, his opponents and them can't, can't help him later on and get that shot because he'd have to come in here after Jake, which is the only way he can shoot Jake now is if he does enter those woods. The Rombot can't do anything else. He's stunned, so he can only do one thing. He can either shoot or fire, but he cannot do, he cannot do both this turn. Uh, we do have uh, Trish who's kind of hanging out here by Bethesda, but her range is very limited. You know, she's got five inch range, one, two, three, four, five. So nothing is within her range, uh, unfortunately, at this point. So I think the only person that is going to really act now, the easy one here is Jake. He's got a clear shot on this guy with no cover. Jake has a army rifle, which has 24 inches. It rolls two dice. Uh, Jake's also wearing combat armor. He's rolling two dice, so one, two, three, four, five, six. He's not within six. He needs five. His combat skill is zero. Uh, I don't know if he has anything else from... The rifle let's see what that what that if that gives him anything else because uh, man that he needs fives well it is an auto rifle so you just he just has two shots he can fire them separately or he can fire them together so I'm gonna I'm gonna do this I'm gonna fire his shots 
And this is what I like to do to speed the game up. Another trick I'll show you. So, the brown die will be the shot. And I am going to make this gold die be the toughness. So, the first shot, let's see. One and a two. He did nothing. Now, you see the brown dice have started rolling low. Before, they were rolling sixes every turn. Now, they're rolling low. So we're going to do this again. This time the brown dice is going to be the shot. The white will be the toughness. And another one and a two. A one and a three. So both of those shots did nothing. That was a total waste. Total waste. That was terrible. That was real bad. Like I said, she has no shot. And I'm certainly not moving her out of her cover. Mace... I'm not putting Mace on the edge like that. He's staying right here, and he's going to let them come to him. I think that is going to wrap up turn two. Now, the interesting thing is, at the end of turn two, we have to roll for a battlefield event. Okay, so the battlefield event was kind of non-climatic. Basically, something valuable showed up. We had to place it in a random direction. If a crew member gets there, they get 1d3 credits, which... I'm not going to be risking none of my lives. They say the enemies will ignore it. But to give you guys a good aerial view of the battlefield at this moment, you can see these uh, Pharaoh are closing in on Jake and his crew, although the target for Jake and them is still well tucked away. Him and his lieutenants are just kind of sitting up there refusing to be baited in. And this is a tense battle. Our Rombot, which is kind of our... Our best and our, you know, most heavy, heavily armed and reliable option has taken some damage and moved back to kind of repair itself. Uh, Jake has gotten off some shots that have been wholly ineffective. Trish is kind of hanging out by the Bethesda, but she has not really seen anything yet from where she's at. And Mace can hear the enemy drawing closer and closer trying to tempt him to come out and engage them. But Jake is, I mean Mace, I'm sorry, Mace is determined to let them come in to him. All right, and that is kind of where we are at, and we are now going into turn three. Okay, so we could really use some good uh, reaction rolls here, some ones. This is ridiculous. So whenever I'm firing, I, I, I roll low. Whenever I'm trying to get my reaction rolls, I roll high. So I got one, two, which I can actually give to the Rumbot again. But none of us are getting to act in the quick reaction phase. I think I'm going to start using this, this dice tray, the tower. Because unfortunately, when I try to roll on screen for you guys, I'm actually hurting my team and my crew. I don't, I don't believe this. Right? I can roll the dice for an attack. They roll low. I roll the dice to get... My reaction, they roll high. <laughs> you, go you go figure. I can't, you know, it's like, I, it's not, it must not be the dice, it's just me. But anyway, uh, the Rombot can act, but because he still has a stun, he can only shoot or move. And I think what I'm going to do is, I might put him on snap fire. Which means he can actually use his shot uh, if any of them move within range. And I think the rules say if they don't use their snap fire, then uh, they can just act normally in the slow phase. But I'm going to, but since that is also considered taking an action, and I'm going to put this under him to show that he has that snap fire engaged. Uh, that will actually, that will actually uh, remove that last stun from him. But that's the only one we have that can act in that phase. Now these guys are going to start moving in. And so he's obviously going to come in and attack. He has to brawl at that range. He has to move into contact to brawl. So it is going to be him versus Jake. This is basically a roll-off. I will give him the white die. I will give Jake the brown die. 
and we I am going to roll it in my die roller. I'm sorry you guys won't be able to see it. Jake is going I mean I keep calling him Jake Mace. I'm sorry. Mace gets a plus two bra with his uh melee saber. His weapon his weapon is is that elegant? See he has a saber. Let me see. I wonder if I put the wrong thing on there. Cause I thought only the glare blades were elegant. Because I bought him a saber, but maybe it is. Maybe it is. I thought the glare swords had elegant. But he has a boarding saber. Yes, it has brawl, plus one damage, it's melee, and it's elegant. Wow, that boarding saber is cool. What about the glare sword? It's funny, the glare sword does not get the plus one to damage. But I think the glare sword piercing, so it ignores armor. So it doesn't need the plus one. It takes away your... Your armor save. I guess you have to pick your thing. But anyway, let's have them roll. Yes, and that's why I stopped rolling on the table, guys. But here's the result. So he rolled a 6 and a 3, which is definitely a win versus that pharaoh. And these pharaohs have a toughness of 4. He gets a plus one to this because uh, he is using, oh yes, four, he rolled a four plus one, he gets five. So we have killed our first, we have killed our first enemy, yes, Mace just sliced him. Okay, so now what's going to happen is. This guy probably can't see that his opponent, his friend just got killed. So he's going to go one, two, three, four, five, and move in. And now he is going to have to, Mace is going to have to fight a brawl with him. Because the other guy is dead, so he's no longer there. This time he rolled a five. Mace has a two. Plus he gets two brawl for his, uh... He gets two, he gets a two for his, uh, saber. That would only give him a four. Let me see if his combat skill is. All right, well, his combat is zero. And I got to double check, do you add your combat to your melee brawls? I assume you do, as I'm assuming it's just all combats. You use your combat skill, but I will double check. But I have another thing I can do that's going to help him out. Uh, brawls, brawl, brawling. Rolls a d6 adding their combat skill. Now, the other one, they would have, it wouldn't have mattered with the combat skill because they're all zero. So, for right now, it really doesn't matter, but in the future, it would. Now, because his sword is elegant, I get a reroll. Oh, and this time I got a one. So, now, because I don't want to resolve this. I am now going to use a one of my campaign things. And you might say, well, why use it now? Because I want to use it now. Uh, so what I can do is you can end a battle. You can ignore a roll on the injury table, add a new character. So that's not my campaign thing. It's going to be a story point. Okay, guys. So if you watch my videos, you know that you can use these story points for very specific things during the game. I actually have nine story points uh, that I got during uh, the character creation. And you can use it to roll on any table outside of combat. You can use it to roll twice and pick the best result. You can use it for a character ability or similar die roll to work if it fails. So that's like an auto pass. Anytime you roll for anything, you may spend one story point to roll again, but you must accept the new result. So in the last couple of cases, I've been rolling and I'm still losing this combat. If I lose it again, I have to accept it. You can spend a story point to get three credits. You can spend a story point to obtain three XP for any one character. And you can spend a story point to take an additional campaign action. So I'm going to spend one now to re-roll this again. And I have a three. So, with my plus two boarding saber, that gives me a five. He is at a five. 
if you are tied, that means that both of us have injured each other. So, I mean, this this has been tough. I mean, this guy, Mace, is using everything he has on this one. He's probably tired from the last fight. Now we have to, we both have become injured. So let me see how that works with the uh, toughness and things. I guess we're going to have to roll that out. So his toughness, their toughness is, I think, four. And I think mine is three. Yep, so I'm going to roll these again, and we're going to be doing the same thing. Uh, Mace is looking for a four. This guy is looking for a three on his white die. So we can see here Mace has a five plus one is a six. So he definitely will kill this guy. He beat his toughness. But this guy also beat my toughness. But I have an armor saving throw from my frag vest of a 6 plus. So basically, I need a 6 to save on this. And as I told you guys, that is not a great armor saving throw. But let's see what we can get. I get a 5 on my armor saving throw. I'm trying to see if I have anything that will, that will help that. Okay, the only thing I can do is use another story point to re-roll again. And this time I need a 6. Because that is all that armor vest gives me. And I did not get it. So Mace is going to go down. We will have to determine his status at the end of the game rolling on the injury table. But I think he did very well. He took out two of these guys. They are going to have to roll for morale next turn. Uh, and that was a tough fight. That was a tough fight. The next one is now going to move. He is going to go one, two, three, four, five. That's his speed. So he cannot move into combat with him with a dash. You can't use a dash to move into combat. Uh so, because I don't, I mean, I don't even know if he can go over there and attack uh, Mace. He probably could. I'm sure there's some rule that probably says he could attack him and take him out of action. But we're not going to be playing that. So he is stuck right there with his five, unless he decides to do something different. But he has to move up, and that's 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 the only cover he can get. So he is going there. This one is now also going to take his move. And he is going to move one, two, three. Well, let's see. He comes out here one, two, three, four, five. He can actually try to get into combat. Or he can move away from Jake and get into cover. But I think they're getting a little confident. They've got one guy down. And maybe he thinks Jake's going to miss with that shot. Or maybe he doesn't see Jake. But that is where they are at. I think now these guys are going to move one, two, three, four, five, six. So he stays in cover somewhat. They've seen that first kill. He's moving one, two, three, four, five. And Caesar is moving one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, the question is. Did uh did uh Rombot have any shots from there? And I think she's gonna have a shot on that one right there. And so Rombot is firing a hunting rifle. It is one shot. It's past six inches. It has no cover. Rombot has a combat skill of one. So that is a 3 plus 1 is a 4. And that would be a miss. But I am also going to use a story point to re-roll that. I cannot allow this to go south because our, our, our luck is not helping me. So I'm going to have to rely on... Uh, I'm going to have to rely on something else. Which is, you know, ability. So let's roll that again. Six, yes. So that is definitely a hit at that range. And 
we're definitely going to get a stun. So that will push it one back. And I know you're supposed to push it back from where it came. But, uh, well, let's see. It would go back here. So let's just push it back there. And as you can see, I don't know if you could see that. We pushed it back. But now we're going to see if we can score a, a kill. Toughness of four. Does the hunting rifle do any extra damage on its damage roll? One. Three and four. So we equaled it or exceeded it. And this one is down. The Rombot has scored a kill. Now things are starting to look a little bit more manageable. A little bit more manageable. And I think that's all their moves. Unfortunately, that was Jake's best shot. Uh, and maybe Trish's only shot. And the Rombot has used its turn. But it is no longer stunned. Uh, now, Jake has to decide what he is going to do. Jake has a... Uh, he has a... Is it, what is this? An AR. Is that a... Assault rifle, because that should have enough range. He's going to decide who he's going to go at. An auto rifle. Is that what AR is? Yeah, that's an auto rifle. And he has two shots with his auto rifle. And it has a range of 24, which means he can do 12 in this game. So, let's see what who's within range. So, this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So, that guy is in range. He's beyond 6. So, Jake is going to be needing... He would need 6s to hit. Okay, so Jake could fire at that lieutenant right here. But... I think he is going to take a shot at this guy in the open because they both would be, he would need a six either way. And the reason he's going to take a shot at that guy is if he kills him, then he can target the lieutenant. Uh, but he also wants to stop that guy from possibly uh, getting to Mace, who is down, or even getting the Rombot engaged in a, a melee. So we are going to take this shot. Yes, I wrote a six. You guys didn't see it, but I wrote a six. So that is a hit. Yes, finally. And I didn't have to use a story point. So now, does it have? It doesn't add anything to damage, but he is a four plus. Let's see. I wrote a three. And I don't know, do I have anything to add to that? Uh, I needed a four to kill him. I wrote a three. You know what? I'm trying to decide. Should I use a story point? Because he will take a stun. He will go back one inch. And with a stun, he can only do one thing. He can only move or shoot. And he couldn't shoot from there. So, I think I'm going to put the stun on him. I'm not going to use a story point. And he's going to go back one inch. Actually, that's going sideways, but... <laughs> That's back away from the shot. But he has that stun on him, which means next turn, he can only do one thing. Now, Jake has another shot, right? So I could shoot at him again if he's within 12. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. I could then possibly put two stuns on him, which would mean that... Well, he'd be one stun away from being killed. I think I'd rather take this shot at the lieutenant. So how far away is he? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, whatever. He's still, I'm still going to need a six. So that's why I didn't use my story point. Because I'm going to need a six to make this shot. So let's see. And I rolled a three. So I am going to use one more story point. Just to try one more time. 
and I rolled a two. So that did not work. I did not did not hit him. It was just too far away. All right, so now the attention turns to poor Trish, who's just watched her brother fall over there and doesn't know what condition he's in. Uh, she could move five, but her pistol only has a range of five, so she could go one, two, three, four, five, and then she'd be one, two, three, four, five, six. She'd still be too far to target him. But she could be closer to her brother to kind of get between him and the uh, between him and the uh, Pharaoh next turn. So I think she's gonna have to try to do that. Although if she doesn't act in the quick phase, she's gonna leave herself wide open, which I don't necessarily like doing that. But she could actually move seven. So she could go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So she's not quite in the open, but she's not quite in cover either. Hmm. There's not a good result. If we had got that lieutenant, I wouldn't be so worried about her. But without with him out there like that, she, she will be moving into some danger going out into the open like that. And she really is like the lightest armed, has the less stuff on her. Uh, and at this point, I don't know. I don't know. I want her to be able to do something. So this is what I'm going to do. She is going to move one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I'm going to relocate her to that end of the vessel, uh, the Bethesda, because that is what Jake told them is to fall back on the Bethesda. And so I am going to relocate her there. And I think that is going to be everything in this turn. We do not have to roll for an event. But we do have to roll for the morale now. And let me see. Let me see if I understand these morale rules. Okay. So as Caesar and his lieutenant surveyed a battlefield, they've lost three guys. Which means I get to roll three dice. And any dice that are equal or below their panic number... And they take off. Now, knowing their luck, they'll roll all five or sixes, you know, because of, obviously every time I roll for them, they do great. But we need some ones or twos because that is their panic number. Caesar himself, though, <laughs> will not take off. He's fearless, which is perfect for this scenario if we can get the other two to skedaddle. So let's roll. Should I roll the white? Right, I could roll some white dice, which have not been very kind to me today. So I could either roll these white dice, I could roll these gold dice, or I can roll the brown. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo, touch a pharaoh by his toe. If he hollers, let him go. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. So the pharaoh are going to get these. Looking for ones or twos. There were three kills. Yes! Ha oh, ha, it worked! Can you believe that worked? It's almost like the Three Stooges or something. You know, I said they used to do stuff and you didn't think it would work, but it would. Two, two of them have to leave. So that is going to be him and him, the lieutenant and the specialist. So let me read this to see how they leave, whether they start leaving or they just go. Okay, so they just flee off the table. That was the specialist, and that was the lieutenant. They have bailed. <laughs> they have bailed on Caesar, but Caesar is still alive, and he is our objective. And he is not without his own defenses. But we will see what happens. Oh, wait, 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 wait. There's one guy still up there. But guess what? The way the rules work, the lieutenants and them bail because. You take the figures closest to the board edge, right? So this guy would not bail, even though it would be preferable that he bailed because he's a lesser figure. But because these two were closer to the edge, they are the ones that bailed, and this guy is stunned. So that is by the ruse. I did that perfectly by the book. I did not manipulate that in any way whatsoever. Fingers crossed. Okay. 
So we are now going to start turn four. At the end of this turn, there will be another uh, battlefield event. But I will tell you guys this. I, I did pick up some more rules that, are, that I could have used that I will try to implement later. One of them is aiming, which means when, uh, when Jake fired and he did not uh, move and he was not stunned, he could have aimed, and it's automatic. You don't have to use an action or anything. You just say you're aiming because you're not stunned and you did not fire, which meant he could have rerolled any ones. I, I think one of them was a one. Uh, only one of them, but that, that could make a big difference. There's one other rule I saw, but I'm not going to tell you guys that unless I use it. I like that rule, and I want to see how it works. So at this point, Caesar is pretty much on the field alone. He's got one soldier who's stunned and probably doesn't know his friends, his captains, his other leaders have bailed on him. And so he does not quite know the situation he's in, but Caesar is basically on his own now. And he is going to have to see if he can kill them all on his own. But he, like I said, he is not without his own defenses. Caesar has a shell gun with a 30-inch range, which would be 15 in this game. It rolls two shots. It's heavy, and it has area. So he is not without his defenses. And, I mean, we're going to have to come to him if we want to, if we want to deal with him, although he is aggressive, so he's, he can't simply just hide. But uh, I will have to decide how I'm going to play that out now that he's on the field alone. You know, he's got too much pride to simply run away. But, you know, he's also not a fool. So, you know, maybe he's going to find a good place to make his stand and dare them to come to him. Like, which one of you want to die? So <laughs> we will see. At this point, though, what we need to do is we are going to roll for our characters' uh, reactions one of them is down, so we won't be rolling a die for him, but we still have three that we can get reactions for. And obviously, if we can get some early reactions in here, that will give us a better chance against Caesar. So let's just roll them on camera. Well, that looks good so far. Yes. Yes. So we have a two. I don't know if you can see that. And we have a one. The other one was a three, which won't help us, but we can assign these. Okay, the Rombot's basically the only one that can use the uh, two, but he has no stuns on him. So he is in a very good position at this point uh, to do something. And since he's not stunned, he can move and fire. And that is what I'm going to have him do. He is going to move and fire at Caesar. Okay, I'm going to do one correction before I do anything to keep it fair. I'm giving this one to Trish. And I will show you guys why I'm doing that in a second. In the meantime, the Rombot is going to take his turn. He can do a move and then a fire. The Rombot's speed is four. So he can go one, two, three, four. I'm going to put him right there. I know that will leave him in the open, but now we have to try to complete this mission. His honey rifle has a range of 30, which 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 15. He's well within range. He's getting one shot at Caesar. And he's basically going to need a 6. Yes! And he rolled a 6! Right off the bat, shoo! Dang, that just blasted Caesar back. Now the question is, did he kill Caesar or not? Let's see. So, does Caesar have any armor? No, his toughness, though, is five. Wow, his toughness is five. So, we're going to need to roll for our roll. Let's see, the, the rifle, does he get any damage to... Does it add anything to its... Uh, to its damage, it has plus one to its damage. Let's roll. So we rolled a two, which I am going to re-roll at using a story point. And, oh no, that one, that one didn't bounce. 
But that one did, and that is a six. So they have killed Caesar with one shot. The Rombot repowered, it rebooted its systems, and it killed Caesar with one shot. And he let me see if he has any armor saving throws. Let's see. Let's be fair. Let's be fair. No toughness of five. Caesar is down. We have accomplished our objective. Wow. The Rombot is powering itself. Wow, did you guys see that? Did you guys see that? The Rombot took him out. That whole game he had been hiding, hiding, hiding back there. And the Rombot took him out. Now that's how you use a story point. But now it is time for Trish to see if she can save her brother. Because she is definitely worried about this guy uh, creeping up on her brother like that. And he will get a chance to move, even though he would not have a chance to, uh, to shoot. Although normally I think he'd have to attack this guy who's within three of him. Uh, but I'd have to check their rule status. But I'm going to move her now. I got a couple of options. I can move her one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right here. In which case, if he did melee, it would be her. But she wouldn't get a chance to do anything back. Or I could move her up for a shot by going one, two, three, four, five, and then taking that shot. She has a she has a, a scrap pistol, which is not very accurate, and has one little shot. And I'm not very sure if that's going to help. I think that pistol will help her better if he tries to brawl her. So I'm going to move her here. She is now protecting her brother from that thing right there. And I almost need to see what happens with him. I got to see whether you do it now or at the end of the turn because... There's a rule that if you complete your objective, you have to roll to see what they do. Okay, so using the aggressive rules, it says aggressive enemies with opponents in sight will advance at least half a move towards them, attempting to remain in cover. Now, he is actually, they are not in sight because they're not on the edge. So really, the only one in sight here is the Rombot. But it says they will not try to brawl with an opponent that has a higher combat skill than them. And the Rumba does have a higher combat skill. So that means this thing is going to simply fire its weapon. It's within three, which is actually a pretty good shot for a Pharaoh. Uh, it has a military rifle, which rolls one die. So it is basically looking for a three or better. And it rolled a one. It could not even hit from there. And it cannot do anything else. Because it has that stun on it. That now allows uh, Jake to fire. And remember, Jake has a, uh, I think it is an assault rifle or army rifle with a range of 24, which in this case goes to 12. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So he definitely has the range on him, Jake does. But... Jake is going to aim, right? That is, remember I told you about that rule, because as long as he's not stunned, and as long as he, uh, as long as he's not stunned, and as long as he has not moved, he can aim, which means he can reroll ones. In addition, in addition, my friends, Jake is also going to use, uh, <laughs> Panic shots. <laughs> that is the other rule I told you about. Panic shots, baby. Panic shot means he gets to roll two more dice, but it empties his weapon, right? It empties his weapon with the panic shot. Now, I'm going to double check this just to make sure that, you know, you can use panic uh, with your aim, or at least it doesn't say you can't. May opt to expend all their available ammo. They engage in panic fire. If 
firing at half, oh, this half the weapon's base range. So I couldn't use that because, well, I couldn't use them both because I either would have to move up so I clear some of that distance or, which would take away my aim, or I have to do the panic fire. So I think I'm going to do the panic fire. I mean, the aiming only rerolls ones anyway. It says conduct attacks is normal, but roll two additional shots. So we're going to show you how we're going to do this. First shot, I'm going to do the brown die will be the shot, meaning at this range, I basically need a six. Uh, and I'm going to use a gold die to indicate the damage, which he is there for. So I would need a, and I don't know if I get a bonus on this or not. I have no combat skill. But, uh, and this weapon has no damage bonus. But, so I get four turns, though. A one and a three, that's not going to do it. Next one. A two and a three, that's not going to do it. So now I need to be a little more cautious. I only have two more shots left. Looking for that six. Let me put it in my roller. Sorry, guys. I don't do well rolling on that table for Jake. I got a one and a four. That didn't do it. And the last one, a two and a one. So four quick shots. None of them hit, which I guess is thematic since it was panic shot. Now, that weapon is considered empty, which is the army rifle. But I still have my hand cannon. So that's why it really wasn't that detrimental to me. Uh, this guy is probably going to run off the field at the end of this turn anyway. Uh, which we will roll for now. Uh, how many people died in this turn? You do not count. You do not count the people that ran off because two ran off. The only one that died was Caesar. But I'm trying to see whether you you roll for uh, everybody that's died since it started or everybody that died this turn. Let's see. So it's one d six per casualty this round. So remember that. So it's not like. Uh, if it's been four the whole game, you'd still roll four dice. There was only one casualty this round, so I only roll one D6, but his panic is a one or two. And this time I roll a six. Can you believe that? I needed all those sixes and never rolled one. This time I rolled a six, so he will not leave, which is probably good because that way one of us can score a kill or do some other stuff. Looks like the Rombot's going to get all the kills. Uh, this is the end of turn four, so there is a battlefield event, which we will see what that is because that may def decide whether we hold the field or not. I mean, and there is still one guy on here. Now, because he did do a shot, he this stun would come off of him. Okay, so I think that's everything that we needed to be aware of. Okay, so this, the event was another item, which is that red marker there. Uh, if we get that, we can get a loot item on the table. And actually, it says you can get it immediately. But uh, the game is somewhat wrapping up, so I'm not sure that that's going to be all that significant to get it immediately anyway. Uh, what we have to do, though, is roll for our reactions because this guy is still on the table and uh, is still a threat. So I have... I have three characters still in the game, which means we will roll three dice. We got one, two, which the only person we can get at two is, of course, our Rombot, who has an excellent shot right there. And uh, he has not moved. He has no stun marker, so he is going to aim. And his honey rifle only gets one die. But I think he only needs a three at this range. So let's work that out. See if we can get this camera to stay focused. And he rolled a five. Three, four, five, or six. Yes, so that would be a hit. So now we need a four. He rolled a three, but he has a combat skill of one, which is a four. And so the last opponent falls from the table. Obviously, at this point, Trish will move over here and claim that loot item. 
as you can see there. Jake has succeeded at his first mission. He's even held the field, him and his team. He will move here and pick up 1D3 credits, which I guess we can roll for now. I'm going to re-roll that. I don't know why I rewrote that. But anyway, that would be one credit. Uh, you guys can't say I don't play fair, even though I'm playing solo. But I think that is it. <laughs> I think Jake and his crew have held the field. You know, we're going to have to roll to see what happened to uh, Mace. Although I may not even roll. I may just go ahead and say he, he recovers. Uh... I might take a look at that injury table and see whether I can use a story point on it or not. But I'm going to give you guys my thoughts on the game, uh, you know, right after this. All right, everybody, welcome to the post-game wrap-up. So, wow, that was fun. That was very, very, very enjoyable. Uh, did not go the way I expected it to go. Uh Unfortunately, dice do not care, right? They are going to be dice. Uh, I will say that uh, I was hoping that Jake did more, got more involved, but I mean, he did his shots. I think he had a good spot most of the game and he played smart. So unfortunately, I don't think Jake got any kills. Uh, Mace did real well in hand to hand with that uh with that saber. So that was impressive. Although in the last battle him and his opponent took each other out at the same time. I'm trying to decide if I'm going to use my mulligan on on Mace or let him roll. I'm going to look at the table. Uh if it looks too gruesome, I might just go ahead and use it. If not, you know, if it's more likely he's just going to get set out for a while, then I will I will go ahead and roll. I went through a lot of story points. I started the game with four, I mean with nine, and I've got four left. But I'm hoping I can get some of them back. So I will go through the post battle, which I haven't done before. So hopefully they will return some of my story points. But I felt since this was their first mission, I needed to use as many as I, I needed to. I did not want to lose anybody in the first mission. And I really thought it was important to succeed on the first mission. So, I mean, I was using story points quite liberally. As they get more experience, you know, you won't really need to use your story points as much. Uh, now, I'm going to talk about two things. The first thing I'm going to talk about is the game and the gameplay. And the second thing I'm going to talk about is uh, kind of your crew and your tactics or your strategy in the game. With regards to the game and the gameplay, I mean, man, this was fantastic. It actually played much more funner than I thought. I will say the ranges made a huge difference in this game. And you don't have to do that, but I think just looking at the ranges with the table that's recommended, you almost have to do that. Uh, you know, because if you're shooting across the table at... 24 or 30 inches yes you still need sixes which you're not going to get a lot of hits with sixes but at the same time uh in a mission like this where i'm trying to assassinate somebody i'm i'm almost never going to uh make it because just with their numbers they would have picked us off all sooner or later i would have had to run because they could just shoot from 24 inches away and never really engage uh, the fact that I cut the ranges in half meant they had to move and come to me and they're aggressive. So that meant they were coming to me as you saw toward the end of the game. And that made a big difference because me and my team were able to kind of sit there, uh, and do that. And I mean, that's probably more of your tactics and strategy, but as far as the gameplay went, man, there were a lot of things that surprised me about these rules because every time I thought of something, it turns out it was already in the rules. So like at one point I was going to say, well, I'm going to create a rule where they can aim. But I instead I went and checked the rules again and it was in there with regards to aiming. 
uh, with regards to the panic fire. I think that's an excellent rule where you just empty your weapon and you get those two extra shots. Uh, the melees were, were wonderful. Like at one point I wanted a reroll and I said, well, what can give me a reroll? And like, wait, this is an elegant weapon. He gets a reroll. So that was pretty cool. Uh, and it was so thematic where they were charging in one at another out of him and he was just slacking them down with that with that that saber. So that was real thematic. Uh I really liked that about the ruse. I love the way like they put the battlefield events in here. I was thinking at one point, oh I'm gonna I'm gonna create some kind of roaming element like in Frostgrave. And then I kept reading, I'm like, wait, here it is right here. It's called Battlefield Events. So every other round you have these things popping up. And I was rolling high. Like I was rolling 90 both times, which is why I got like loot or treasure. But I don't want you to think that's kind of all the Battlefield Events are. There are some other things that could happen. And I mean, the game just gives you so many mental possibilities, man. You will never sit here and be bored. You're constantly thinking, how can I get my crew out of this? How can we survive this? Do I want to use a story point? Do I want to use a mulligan? I mean, at one point, if one more person had died, I was going to use my mulligan, which was, uh, what is that? Everybody, let's get out of here or that's enough for the day. It's called Time to Go. I was going to use that. I was like, if one more person dies, it's time for us to go. But we made it. And then the other thing was you had this one where you could bring a new character in. And I was thinking at a point because Caesar and his guys were hanging out like toward the, the end of the table. And I was like, you know, what? I should use that rule and bring a guy in right on that table edge and just take a pop shot at Caesar. Like Caesar would not even have known that we had another crew member who's worked his way around the back and he just takes this shot at Caesar. And you know, especially if you got a close combat guy. Guy just gets in close combat with Caesar while he's hiding or, you know, using his men to screen him. That would have been so thematic. But I was gonna pull that, but you know, my big break came with the morale. Oh my goodness, that saved our butts. Now there are some that do not are not affected by that. And their panic numbers are different. These guys, I was lucky it was one or two. Uh which I guess that's actually kind of some of the harder ones. Because if you get like one, two, three, or four, they're almost always gonna panic. So these guys, uh I did, I guess I did well with that panic roll. Because when I got the with the lieutenant and the specialist being the last ones kind of there. And that they had kind of hung back. And then they got the panic roll. That was so thematic. They just took off when they saw those three guys go down. And I guess they knew, heck, we're next. If Caesar's throwing them out there, he's going to throw us out there next. So that was very, very thematic to see that happen. Uh, although I may have, they may turn into rivals now. You know, they're, they're, they may replace Caesar uh, with another leader, Cornelius or somebody like that. Uh, and they may turn into rivals, uh, but we will see. I'm not. I'm not too worried about that. So that is that is kind of the game rules, man. I'm telling you, like anything you can think of, you know, this guy has already thought of it. Meaning the author. Uh, and man, it's just it's a fun game. And the only thing I will say is you you want to resist the temptation to simply set up your figures and start rolling dice and firing across the table. Because there is a lot of rules in here that if you take the time and think carefully between your moves and your opponent's moves, it will it will bring out the, the theme of the game. It will bring out the flavor of the game. And that is a big compliment to a set of rules. I tried to film this so that you guys could keep up with what was going on. And you guys could kind of see the positions of the figures and what they were looking at and what they could see. So I hope that worked out. Uh, my light started to get bad. It's kind of like 12 at in the morning or 11 at night. So uh, I, I will see about setting up some additional light. Uh, although for this jungle scenario, it kind of didn't bother me too much. Uh, and it might just look like that on my camera. Sometimes when I watch the videos after I put them up, it's, it's lighter than I thought. Uh, let me see what else I can talk about Looking just looking at my sheet. Don't forget to record what is happening. So I did record 
that may score the first kill and it was with the Pharaoh in a brawl. So that will make a difference when you start doing XP and story points. Rombot scored three kills. He also killed Caesar. So that may make a difference. Uh, I wound up picking up some more credits. That last that last thing was some credits. So I think this just before, even before the post battle, I picked up like five, six credits. Uh, and I am also going to do a thing since I am playing for credits where if my guys hold the battlefield that they can pick up any weapons uh, that the uh, the fallen enemies would have left. Now obviously enemies that ran off the field, you cannot pick up their weapons. Uh, but I'm going to let my guys pick up the weapons. For example, I think Caesar was on the field killed and they killed three other guys. Uh, but I'm only going to, I'm, I'm going to let them pick up the weapons and then change them in for credits. Basically, I'm not going to let them pick up the weapons and necessarily use them, although I should do that. Uh, but what I will do is let them pick up the weapons and get one credit for every, for all the weapons that these guys had on them. So for example, I know Caesar had a shell gun, which I would definitely like to take. The other guys only had military rifles. So, uh, and I don't know, did Caesar has a, have a blade or not? Or was that one of the lieutenants? Uh, yeah, he just had his shell gun, which he never got to fire. So I will probably give them some credits for that because there is a thing in the rules where you can, you can trade in weapons for one credit each. And since this is a credit campaign, that would make sense. Since they held the field, if they did not hold the battlefield, I wouldn't let them do that. But in addition, I'm also going to roll for having held the battlefield and see what they get for that. But uh, other than that, man, I don't really know what else to tell you guys as far as uh, as far as uh, my thoughts on the game. I mean, obviously, I loved it. Obviously, it was great fun. Uh, I'm really looking forward to, you know, my next game. I'm so excited what's it going to be, what they're, where are they going to wind up next. I'm still thinking of a name for Jake Mandrake and his crew, but it's a few things starting to come to mind. Uh, but I'm definitely looking forward to uh, to Jake's journal about this, their, their, first, their first basically encounter or mission or job. Uh, and then we are going to start setting this up and see where they are going to be heading to next. Uh, like I said, we will be doing the post-battle part of this. I am going to be putting up a video uh, kind of discussing the terrain and other things like that, which hopefully will help you guys as you start to prepare to get into some of your own games. Uh, I'm watching a lot of videos where I'm starting to see some good figures. Uh, that you can use in some of these games and uh, yeah guys I mean this is a plus I give it an a plus uh, you know a plus plus for for the combat and uh, the scenario more importantly the combat the scenario everything was just fantastic guys so I hope you guys enjoyed that I know this video is getting long so I'm gonna go and then uh, I will see you guys again soon take care and God bless Unity Security, this is Acting Captain Jake Mandrake aboard the science vessel Bethesda, Captain Charles Mandrake commanding. We are departing Kiris 2 under Sector Permit Z783Y4. We have one injured crew member of Rigoran Ancestry, name Mace Yarrow. Request any and all vessels with mad bays activate medical beacons. We have a dispatch for Unity Provost JL Breacher. The following dispatch is being sent at the request of the Kiris government. Governor O'Maris reports as follows. The feral fugitive known simply as Caesar has been neutralized. I say again, Caesar is dead. I regret to report that remnants of his crew escaped, but efforts are underway to apprehend them as well at the earliest opportunity. Governor O'Maris out. End dispatch. Jake Mandrake aboard the science vessel Bethesda, signing off.